Welcome back, everyone, to another segment of Rabbi Jeff Spirky Abashir, where we attempt to understand the meaning behind the instructions of our sages and how it's relevant to our lives today. We do this, of course, using the thoughts of our teachers before us and try to make them applicable to our times. Feel free, please, to contact me with any comments or questions at rjfromlj at aol.com. Sorry. Okay, continuing on from Ramon Gamliel Benosha, Rabbi Yehuda Anmasi. So the Mishnah continues on and says that that you have to make God's will like your will, so that he makes Ritzoncha, he makes your will his will. Batel Ritzoncha, you have to nullify your will, Mipne Ritzono, because of his will, in front of his will. So that he nullifies the other's wills in front of yours. I'll come back to that. Hillel Omer, Hillel says, like smack in the middle of nowhere, Hillel says, this is Hillel that we met in the first chapter. This is Hillel, which is generations later, not in the same, he's not in the same period of time. Don't separate yourself from the community. Don't rely on yourself until the day you die. Don't judge another person until you get into their place. Don't say something that is very difficult to understand, hoping that in the end people will work out all the details and they'll get it. Vial Tomer and don't say, Eshna, when I have better time, when I have more time, when I have free time. So then Eshna I will learn because Shema Lo Tipana. Because maybe you're never going to have that time. Now, as, as I told you, this is an incredibly packed Mishnah. I mean, just the, the amounts of, of information that's here, the amounts of, of life lessons that are here is really something incredible. But before I deal with every life lesson, I, putting these two Mishnayas together, which I've decided to learn them that way, again, even though there are some texts which separate the two, put the first part, I say Ritzoncha Kirtzonecha, Ritzoncha Kirtzoncha as one Mishnah, and then Hillel Omer as a separate Mishnah, we're going to learn it all as one thing. So, of course, the question you have to ask is, what's the connection between all of these informa- pieces of information? Making your will like God's will, making God's will like your will. Don't separate yourself from the community. Don't judge people until you get to their place. Don't rely on yourself until the day you die. You you haven't made it until, it ain't over until it's over. Don't say things that are unclear, hoping that, oh, you know, they'll figure it out. And don't say that, don't procrastinate. So it's froth with problems. The first problem is, is that what exactly does this mean? that make your will, make God's will like your will. What's the, what, what's the point of that? Make God's will like your will. I mean, you know, do, do what he wants, but what does it mean make God's will like your will? And it sounds like the reason why you want to do that is so that quid pro quo, he's going to make your will his will. What is it, a game? You know, you be good to God, God will be good to you. That's, again, this, this hits to the center core of things that we've been talking about, which is there's no such thing as reward. We, you know, we don't talk about reward and punishment. We don't do things for reward. So why is it, again, dangling in front of our face? Do this in order that that should happen. And what's the that should happen? That you be good to God, so God is good to you. What does that mean? That's, that's, that's problem number one. Problem number two, that batel ritzoncha. Once you do God's will, you have nothing left to be mevatel. You have nothing left to nullify. In other words, your will is God's will. So if your will is God's will, then what's the next dictum, which is, and nullify your will in front of his will. Well, I did because I did what he wanted. I made my will his will. Once I made my will his will, what did I do to my will? I, I nullified my will. I got rid of my will. So what does that mean, battle? Why do we have to have a separate sentence there of battle? And then again, that he's going to, to make others secondary in front of you. So this is now, it's a game. So I'm going to do this so that I can get ahead of everybody else. I can, I have a way to beat you. I'm, 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 I'm better to God than you are. Like, what is, what's going on here? What's the message that, that the Roman wheel is trying to teach us? Okay, and, and then look at the connection to the, why, where does that, 
This is a Mishnah by Rabbi Gamliel. And then all of a sudden we stick in Hillel. Fikum Hillel to this. What's Hillel doing over here? Plus, Hillel already spoke to us. Hillel spoke to us beautifully. We loved his Mishnah. He's Mishnayos in the second, in the first chapter. There wasn't enough room in the first chapter to put this in also? That this could have fit in the first chapter. There's messages that fit with the tone of the first chapter. Why not put them in the first chapter? Hillel says, be a lover, right? Be like the, the students of Aaron, love, peace, pursue peace. And then, you know, talk about the antidote of, of how not to, not to be not like that. Why don't you just put that over there? Put it in the first chapter. What are you putting it over here for in the second chapter? What does it mean, al tifrosh min You know what that sounds like? A piece of advice. Al tifrosh min It's not a good idea to separate yourself from the community. Be community minded. Be part of a group. Be part of a community. Do you know? Do you know what this is? The Ramam says that this is one of the things that a person loses their portion in the world to come. If a person separates himself from the community, the community does one thing, he does something else, then he loses his portion in the world to come. That's not a good idea. That's an imperative. That's an imperative obligation. So why is it being put here in a sense of that this is a good piece of advice? And if it's a halacha, that a person separates themselves from the community, they lose their portion of the world to come, then it doesn't belong in Perky Avos. It's not a halacha. This is a manual for, for, for ethical development. How is this ethical development? Okay, next problem. What does it mean, al tamin ba'atzmacha, don't trust in yourself until the day you die? It's referring to, there was a Kohen Gadol who served for 80 years, a high priest, fought against the Sadducees, and then in the end, we talked about him in the very, very beginning, and then in the end, he actually became an apostate. He became a Sadducee. It's just an incredible thing. 80 years. So that means that the guy had to be a minimum of, of 100 when he died. Because if he served as a high priest for 80 years, started at 20. So you're talking about that he was 100 years old. And, and right before he died, he became a Sadducee. Wow. How does that happen? And from there we learn, you know, don't rely on yourself. You might be a firm person now, but you never know what's coming. You, you might love God now, but you never know where you're going to end up. Really? And again, what's the ethical imperative? What are you telling me? You're telling me that I can always fall down? Isn't that encouraging? I would much rather hear you say, I'm so proud of the accomplishments that you've made in your short lifespan, rather than to say, hold on, because you know what? You could, you could die not like you are now. You could become something terrible. Really? I got a lot to look forward to. Thank you very much. What's the, what's the advice that the mission is giving me when the mission says, don't trust in yourself until the day you die. And then the mission says, don't judge another person until you get to his place. Okay, I mean, how is that different than give the benefit of the doubt? Same thing. Why is this being repeated here? Don't say something that's confusing hoping that in the end, they're going to figure it out. Oh, they, what is this, public speaking 101? Like, you know, when you talk, try to talk clear. Shkai, thank you very much. What's the ethical imperative? How is this making me a better person? What's the, and don't tell me that, you know, you're just being more careful when you speak. No, that's not what the mission is coming to tell me. The mission could care less. If you're not a great orator, you're not a great orator. The mission is not saying that you have to be a great orator. It's not what it's saying to me. So what is, what's the ethical, what's the, the value here that makes sure that when you talk, you're understood and don't think, don't rely on the fact that, you know what, they'll work it out later. And don't say that I'll have time to learn later. You know, for so many people, so many of their dreams are put into this category. When this ends, then I'll be able to devote more time to, and you can fill in the blank, you can put in whatever you want there. But everybody's had that conversation with themselves. As soon as I get out of this situation, then I'll be able to devote myself to that situation. And the mission says, don't live your life like that, because maybe loti panem, because maybe that's never going to happen. And, and the truth is, what I've seen in my small years is that every time a person says, as soon as I get out of this, I'll have more time for that. As soon as they get out of this, they get into the other. And they still don't have time for that. There's one thing follows another. And as soon as one sara ends, another thing starts. One life situation is over, another life situation. Because it's the way, it's called living. It's the way life goes. And, and you don't really not want it like that. It's okay for it to be like that. 
but therefore don't put things off until a situation ends because that situation is never going to be ended. Okay, Shkayich, so what are you telling me? Don't procrastinate. Shkayich, we learned that already. How do we learn that? Imlay Achshov, Emesayev, not now. When? We learned about the midst of procrastination or the, the prohibition not to procrastinate. So what are you teaching to me again for? Remember I taught you in the very beginning, we don't repeat in Pirkei Avos. If something is repeated, there is a new message being sent here. And of course, what's the connective tissue between all of these? Okay. So the truth is, there are multiple ways to understand this Mishnah of what the message of the Mishnah is. There are rabbis that split the Mishnah into two. They finish off on what Raman Gamliel was teaching us and connect it to the previous Mishnayos. And then Hillel saying something completely different. There are those that say that the reason that Hillel is here is because it's connected to Raman Gamliel. And therefore it, it, was, it was put here also. And that the whole Mishnah is teaching me one lesson. I'm going to take that tack, but I'm going to teach a different lesson. I'm, I see from it, I think, a different lesson than the standard. I will teach also the standard lesson, but that's going to have to be after this. Let's see what I think, I think this mission is saying to us. To understand this mission, I think that the first thing we have to understand is the middle of the mission. Don't separate from the tzibur. Why is that such a critical dictum that our rabbis are teaching us. Don't separate from the tzibur. So the first thing that has to be done is that we have to understand what a community is. You know, in this past week's parasha, yesterday, we read what was called the tochacha, the curses. The curses against the Jewish people that if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. That's actually written twice in the Torah. It's written once in the book of Ayikra and once in the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy. In Vayikra, it is written many of the, if you look at the blessings part of it, there's first blessings and then there's curses. So if you look at the blessings part, so then there is, it's written in the plural. And if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, it's written in the singular. So our rabbis point out that, of course, this is written in the plural because it's talking to the community. And the one in Deuteronomy is written in the singular because it's talking to the individual. The Vilna Gon says, Pum Fa Kert, the exact opposite. Says the Vilna Gon, the ones in Vayikra that are written in the plural are talking to every individual Jew. And the ones in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, that is in the singular, is talking to the community. And what the Vilna Gon is telling us is what is the definition of of a Jew, of the Jewish community. We understand that there are two definitions of a community. I have my own personal needs. I have things that I need to accomplish and do in my lifetime. I have goals. I have dreams. Many of those things, though, can't be done alone. To educate my children, I need a school. To be able to, or or so so we thought, and to, to to, to be able to daven, Up until now, my assumption was that I need to have a community. I need to have a shul. I need a shul. You need a shul. The next one needs a shul. So the three of us together will get together and we will create a shul which will serve my needs, will serve your needs, will serve their needs. We'll create a school. The school will serve my needs, will serve their needs, will serve the other's needs. And that in order to get my individual needs solved and served, So then we create this thing called community. The problem with that is, is that, and that is, by the way, a working definition for many, 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 many communities. The problem with that is, is that the community then is merely something to serve me. And as long as it serves me, then that's okay, because we each use the community for what we need. That's not the Torah's definition of a community. The Torah says the word community, one of the words that it uses is the word tzibur. Tzadi, beiz, resh. Tzadi stands for tzadik. Beiz, benoni, middle of the road. Resh, Russia. A community must be made up of tzadik, benoni, rishoyim. Must be made up of righteous people, middle of the road people. People that are, that are more difficult to deal with. That is a community. But with with all of those people, 
what the what what to create a community is that in the end every single person has to give up a piece of themselves to create this entity called Sibur, called community, where I lose to an extent my individual identity and I take on a new identity, the identity of the community. See, a community is never just the composite of a bunch of individuals, but it is grouping together of individuals that have reached their own self-perfection who join together to create a new entity. That new entity has its own needs. Every individual gives up a certain sense of control in order to be able to join and become part of that community. Now, I could spend really literally hours on this, and, and, I, and I feel like I, I'm, I'm in somewhat of a, of a unique position only because I've been dealing with community for, from, the, for, from the level of, um, of organization for 35 years. And it is an incredible thing to watch people's connection to community and what really a community is and what a community functions and it functions well, what it's really functioning as. A community functions well when every individual looks at themselves and says, look, I have needs and this is the way that they're going to be met, but they're going to be met by me making myself part of that community, which means that there are times where I'm not going to feel 100% comfortable but that it's good for the community. And if it's good for the community, then I have a choice. Either this is not the community that I'm going to attach to, or this is the community I'm going to attach to. And that's going to take precedence over my own personal needs. And that's how the community develops a personality of which every single person is a part of. That's why we have this concept called no se ba'olim chavero. No se ba'olim chavero, that we have to carry the burden along with others, that when people are suffering somewhere, that was, by the way, what I felt was so incredible about this corona, that th- there, was, there was no way not to carry the burden with others, and you didn't even have to try because you were carrying the same burden. You know, very often if Israel is going through something and America is not, so then the people in America are carrying the burden along with people in Israel, if vice versa. If the people in America are going through something, people in Israel are not, so then they are forced to have to learn how to be no say all, that to carry the burden along with the others, make themselves part of one community. But because we were all suffering the same thing, we were all literally part of the same community. Right now, we're getting out of this a little bit. In, in America, there's still, in many places in America, they're still deeply in the, in the center of it. And our obligation is to feel a part of that global Jewish community in the sense that it's not about me, but it's about the community. I myself might be safe and protected. I myself might be taken care of. I might have a way, a pathway already, how to deal with this, but they're still forging that pathway, and therefore I have to be a part of that, of that global community. I think everything in this Mishnah is trying to teach me how to forge a community. The first thing that the Mishnah says is that al tifrosh min hatzibur, don't separate from the community. That the first step is is that you have to feel a part and a parcel. You have to take away your own self. You have to take away your own concern of self, and to connect yourself to this com- this concept called community. That this entity called community. Then the Mishnah comes along and tells us that part of joining with a community is giving up control, which means that if the community is going in a certain direction, you're obligated to go in that direction also. If the community is standing, your obligation is to stand. The community is sitting, your obligation is to sit. If the community is doing and accepting a certain standard, your obligation is to accept that standard because it's not about you as an individual it's about the standard of community. Why, no, why can't you tell secrets? It says that don't say something. One of the ways of understanding that is not don't say things that are not understandable now, but will be understood. You hope they'll understand them later. One of the ways of understanding them is don't tell secrets. Don't say something that you think people can't hear now, but that eventually go, they're going to hear. You know, we're always so surprised. We tell a person, oh, d- you know, don't tell this to anybody. I'll just tell you. And then you're shocked when you find out that a thousand other people know it. Oh, what a chutzpah. No, the chutzpah wasn't the person you told that told everybody else. The chutzpah was you. What, what were you thinking? 
when you told a piece of information that should never have been heard, you told it to one person, what, you trusted them? You said, oh my gosh, I, I don't think that that person should, you know, uh, they, they should, I don't think that they're going to tell anybody. You know, the, the problem is, is that why is it that we, that we tell somebody a secret? This is very deep. But the assumption is, is that we have an ability to be able to control them. That they need us and therefore, they're not going to violate this friendship because they need this friendship. They need this relationship with us. And therefore, they're not going to violate this by going to tell the thing that we told them. They're not going to upset me. They're not going to do that to me. They would never do this because they need us. And ultimately, really deep down, there is a certain sense of control that we have. Comes along the mission and says, if you want to create a community, you have to give up that control. You don't control anyone. There is no reason why they shouldn't tell this over to somebody else. Everybody's a human being. If you want to keep something quiet, there's only one method. Keep it quiet. What you, and you have, no, you have to understand, you have no control over others. If we take the other interpretation of don't say things that people can't understand because you hope that in the end they're going to understand, you know, that's also a certain level of control. Because... If I speak clearly, if I worry about every word I'm going to say, how to say those words in a clear, concise fashion, it's not just because I'm worried about me being understood. I want you to understand me. I'm caring about you. If I'm going to speak in a haphazard way and say, you know what, you'll figure it out. You're a smart person. You'll figure it out. And if you don't get it, well, you know, that's your problem. So then who is my concern about? My concern is about me. My concern is not about you. If I talk clearly, then I'm adjusting to you. If I talk in riddles and I'm making no effort to adjust to you, but I'm putting the onus on you to adjust to me, that's not community building. That's not going to create an entity. When every person in the community is concerned about the other person, I'm, I'm trying to adjust myself to make you comfortable, that's what creates community. When I have time, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to learn. But, it, 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 you know, right now I don't have time. But when I have time, I'm going to learn. What's the assumption you're making there? That you're going to control whether you have time or not. You know, every single one of us came into this. We, we was, I was smacked with this in the face. Smacked in the face because I had plans for Pesach. I had plans before Pesach. I had plans Pesach. I had plans after Pesach. I had the next six months of my life worked out really, really clearly. And then God said, ha, ha, ha. And the whole thing, felt, every last piece of that plan was, was, was knocked out. And all it did, made me angry, made me realize not in control. And if you're going to learn how not to be in control, how in a community you're not in control. The community itself is in control. The community itself is that entity. The only way to do that is to loosen your own control on life. And that's, this is not about don't procrastinate. That message was taught to me in the first chapter. This, don't say, when I have time, I will learn. That's saying, don't think that you're in control. Because in order to be able to relinquish yourself to the community, step number one is you've got to give up control. Don't judge other people. It says, don't judge them until you get to their place. This is not telling me giving the benefit of the doubt. What this is saying is, is that when I judge them, I'm making a statement. I'm making a statement. I know you. I know who you are because you are me. We're the same. And therefore, as I can control myself, I can control you. Give up control. Don't trust in yourself. Give up control. You know, it's an amazing thing. How many chapters in Pirkei You can show me with your hands. Anybody know how many chapters in Pirkei Avos? Six chapters in Pirkei That's correct. That's correct. In the Mishnah, there's only five. The sixth chapter is actually considered like an add-on. It's a price or whatever. We'll talk about that in, as, you know, in, as time goes on. But there are five chapters. Some of the rabbis explain the reason that there are five chapters is they correspond to the books of the Torah. First chapter corresponds to Bracious. Second chapter corresponds to Shmos. What's the book of Shmos about? Creating Jewish community. It's about the birth of the Jewish people. Therefore, where does Hillel's dictum belong? Not in chapter one. 
Hillel's dictum belongs in chapter two. Because anything that has to do with creating community, you want to talk about in the building an individual? You want to talk about loving peace, pursuing peace? You want to talk about building an individual? Chapter one. You want to talk about building a community? Chapter two. And that's why Hillel's dictums were placed here in the Mishnah. Why here? Because here, Rabbi Gamliel started off with Ase Ritzono Kirtonecha. Make God's will your will. What's God's will? God's will is that we are his nation, not his bunch of people, not his grouping of people, but that we are his nation. Make that your job. Make that your raison d'etre. Make that your whole life's goal. I say, so no, God's will of creating community. Make that the thing that's front and foremost on your mind. Live your life that way that you're a part of a nation. You're not an individual. You're not sitting on a lifeboat alone. And if you make a hole under your seat, it's not just you that's being affected. It's the entire nation that's being affected. Live your life that way. I say, so no, kiritzonecha. Kideshiyase ritzoncha kiritzono in order that God is going to make your will his will. It's not a, it's not a reward. It's a reality. So that, you, that, God, is going to, that God is going to see it, that, um, that Ritzoncha, that your will, which is, which is to make a community, is Ritzono. It's actually his will. That you will fulfill that which you're meant to be fulfilling here in this world. What's the only way you're going to do that? Says Rabbi Gamliel, Batel Ritzon Chamipne Ritzono. You have to nullify your will. You've got to nullify yourself. You've got to be Mevata yourself. You've got to give up control. And when you give up control, Kideshi Yevatel Ritzon Acherim Mipne Ritzonecha, other people will follow you and they too will give up their control and their, their will for the greater good of the community. Now, I could have said that in an hour. I, I packed it into a half. I, we, I'm going to elaborate a little bit tomorrow, but I want to talk about every piece here because there's more to talk about separating from the community. We got the general idea of it, but there's much more to talk about. But that's the Mishnah. The Mishnah is saying, how do you create community? It's starting from Ramagam Gamliel, which is connected back to his previous statements, which is working for the community, don't follow the non-Jewish leaders, follow the Jewish leaders. And then how do you create that community? You have to nullify yourself. You have to be, make yourself smaller. And the smaller you become, the larger becomes community. Okay. Beautiful.